The parable that we read this morning is called the parable of the talents. And a talent was a denomination of ancient money. So it would appear that the story is about money and its usage, which Jesus spoke about more than any other subject matter, money. In this parable, the master gave sums of money to three of his servants. And the text tells us that the money was entrusted to them, which means that the master expected to have it back. It wasn't a gift, nor was it even a loan, for there is no reason to believe that the servants were in need. The money was instead given to the servants to be held until the master's return. Although Jesus doesn't come right out and say it in the story, the passage suggests that there was an expectation as to the management of this money that was given to them, for it says that he gave the sums to each according to their ability. Jesus again suggests in the story that these servants were not only given unequal amounts, but that their ability to manage the sums of money was also unequal. One of the servants was given more because he had a better capacity to manage that money. One of the servants was given considerably less because he had less ability. But that didn't mean that he had no ability. It was given to him exactly the right amount for his ability to manage. Now, we know from the story what they did with the money and how the, their ability was put to work. And when the master returned to settle his account, we know that the first servant went off immediately and began trading with it. He took his five talents and gave five more in return. The second servant did likewise and doubled his money as well. The third servant, however, fearing his master and being a cautious, Saul did not risk his talent, so he dug a hole and hid it, afraid of losing it. Upon being summoned by the master, this third servant was pleased and proud to be able to present to him exactly what he had been entrusted. The master had given him something to keep and safeguard, and now the master had it. Well, that's the problem with this passage. Of course, most of us relate to this poor third servant who was just being cautious and returning to the master that which he had been entrusted. So it's so unlike Jesus to suddenly turn on the servant. After all, he didn't lose any of it. He didn't go out and risk his one and only talent, his one and only dollar, and squander it on some foolish investment. Instead, he just kept it safe. He kept it hidden so that it wouldn't be lost. Perhaps, if we were to rewrite it the proper way with all that we know about Jesus and his normal response, we would write it something like this. There, there. I understand your fear and your ambitions. I know that you wanted to do what was right. But your fear of losing that which I gave you prevented you from risking stepping out in faith. It could have been worse. You could have lost all of the money in some foolish investment. As it is, you did the best that you could do. And I appreciate your concern for protecting my money. You can keep what you have. You could have made more, but at least you haven't lost any of it completely. This then would have been a story about the cautious servant and the forgiving master. A much more common and appropriate story of Jesus and how God acts with us. However, that's not the parable that we're given. And that's not what the passage tells us. That's not the story that Jesus leaves us with. Instead, we've got a tale 
whose moral is more like those who have will get more, and those who have less will go to hell, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Somehow, that just doesn't sit very well with me. I don't know about you, but it doesn't sit very well with me. So I think there has to be more to this parable. I read a story about an old Swedish Lutheran pastor who preached on this text to his elderly congregation, one of whom was worried about the fate of people similar to this servant who might find themselves in hell rather than being rewarded for faithful stewardship. The biggest concern for this elderly member was not that they would be thrown into the fiery blaze of hell, but rather that they were so elderly that they no longer had any teeth to gnash. The pastor, not willing to undermine the poor man's faith, replied, I'm sure teeth will be provided for you. But that's not the point either. This parable needs to be understood in its full breadth if we are to find the real message that Jesus was trying to tell us. It isn't a parable about forgiveness. So that's why Jesus doesn't end it the way that we think it should be ended. And actually, it's not really even a parable about money, even though money is the object of the story. And this parable is often used as a stewardship sermon. It fits perfectly in this time period of the calendar. Instead, I think it's more about time. The time in which we find ourselves now. The time between the beginning and the end. The parable is told by Jesus between the story of the ten bridesmaids that we read last week and the story of the last judgment. The ten bridesmaids is a story about not knowing when the end of the age is to come, but to be watchful, because it will come like a thief in the night. And the story of the last judgment puts a finality on all that Jesus has been trying to teach us and to them. So I think the story places a premium, not on how to use and spend our money, but on how to use and spend our time, especially for Jesus, as there was not very much time left for him. This parable is the second to last story that he tells the disciples. I think Jesus wants to warn his disciples about how we are going to use what time we have left, what resources We've been given to become creative in gaining more and how we are going to redeem what we have right now in the present. This parable really has nothing to do with physical or monetary investments. It has nothing to do with interest rates or the carefully selected stocks that we've chosen for our portfolios, if you have one. These days, who knows what they would be anyway? Instead, it has everything to do with what we're going to do with what we have. It has everything to do with where we are right now in this moment. When the master in the parable went away, he didn't tell his servant how long he would be gone or when he would return. The test was to see how, living in that insecurity of not knowing, each would manage what they had been entrusted. And isn't that where we are today? That's how we live every day, isn't it? We never know what tomorrow will bring. I remember many, many, many years ago, when I was growing up, sitting in the upstairs hallway of my parents' house, when I was probably no older than seven or eight years old, maybe, probably closer to eight, maybe nine. Some people had come to the door to speak to my mom about religion, 
and their particular brand of faith. I'm sure they were Seventh-day Adventists or one of those groups that usually go around from door to door. And I wanted to hear what they had to say, but not being welcomed in the living room at the time, since I was just a kid, I sat just out of sight upstairs listening. One of the women regaled my mother with scripture verse after scripture verse, and I wasn't yet that familiar with the Bible, but none of the passages sounded very comforting to me. They all had this tone about them, or perhaps it was just the way the woman was saying them and related them. But I had this feeling of urgency and consequence and doom. We're living in the end times, she said over and over again. I tell you, it's the end. You must get your affairs in order. Make sure that you, your family, and particularly your children, are prepared before it's too late. As my mother said goodbye to the women who had sat in our living room, sharing their gospel of fear, I went to my room, sat down on my bed, and cry. I already knew, right then and there, that it was too late. There wouldn't be enough time left to get prepared. My father drank a lot. My mother hated the neighbors down the street. I remember her saying so. I had stolen my cousin's plastic horse when I had been over at their house a couple of months prior to that. And who knew what my sister had done? What if God came that very night to pass down his judgment on us? My mother knocked on the door. She saw my tears and sat down on the bed. I'm so sorry you heard all of that, she said over and over again. God isn't like that. But we're going to go to hell, aren't we? I said. My mom took me in her arms, hugged me and said, No, sweetheart, we're not going to go to hell. God wants us to try and be the best that we can be, but we're not perfect. I'm not perfect, your father isn't perfect, and you're not perfect. But God forgives us when we say our prayers and ask for forgiveness. And then encourage us, encourages us to try to do it all over again. I got up off the bed and went to my dresser drawer. Tentatively, I opened it and reached into the far back of the drawer underneath a collection of rubber balls, underneath socks and underwear, and finally behind a small box that held odds and ends. I had lots and lots of ends. In the very back of the drawer on the bottom, in the deepest, darkest place that I could find, was my cousin's horse. I took it out and got back on the bed. Mom didn't say a word, she just sat there. I took this from Dwayne. I wanted it. He doesn't know that I have it. He didn't give it to me. I just couldn't quite come out and say that I stole it. Well, we'll give it back to him the next time we see him, okay? My mom said. But what if God comes tonight? I wondered. Mom hugged me again and said, I rather doubt that God is going to come tonight. I can't promise that he won't because we don't ever know, but I doubt it. What I do know is that God has already forgiven you. Because you wouldn't have hidden it so well if you didn't already feel guilty about taking it. Just ask God to forgive you, and we'll take it back to Dwayne as soon as we get a chance. What? But what if I do something bad again? Sometimes I can't help it. I try. What did I just tell you? None of us are perfect, Mark said. All that God wants us to do is to try. Life itself is a risk. You could sit here in your room, not speak to anyone, play with your toys nicely, eat all your meals, go to bed. Maybe, just maybe, if you did that every day, you wouldn't do something bad again. 
But what kind of life is that? You couldn't have any friends, because sometimes we say things we don't mean to other people. So you wouldn't want to risk that. God knows that we aren't going to be perfect, and he doesn't want us to shut ourselves up in our room by ourselves. God wants us to risk making mistakes. God wants us to use whatever time he's given us to live a full and complete life, mistakes and all. The important thing I want you to remember is that we believe in God of love and forgiveness, not a God of wrath and doom. Some people never get over the consequences of their sins. They don't know that God has already forgiven them and moved on. They're afraid of God. Whether God comes for us today or a hundred years from now, you are one of God's children, just like you are mine. And although I might get mad at you and punish you for something that you did wrong, I don't stay mad forever, do I? And God is an even better parent than I am. And he never stays mad. My mom taught me that day that we don't believe in a vengeful, angry God, that, but that we do believe in a God who forgives and loves us. Now, almost 50 years have come and gone since that day, and I still hear people saying that we are living in the end times. If I had taken the advice of those women, that came that day to my parents' home, I may not have risked life in the same way. I may have hidden whatever talent I have for fear of a harsh master who reaps where he does not sow, carefully guarding my small corner of the world, keeping safe what God gave to me. In the end, I don't know what I would be able to give back to God. My days, my time, maybe, but not much of a life. Instead, I took my mother's advice, and I have a lifetime already of blessings upon blessings to hand back to God when that time does come. So, what have you been doing with the time that God has given you? Have you managed that time well? Rather than being concerned about when the time will come and worrying about that, what are you doing right now with what God has given you? Thanks be to God.